Well, welcome everybody for hanging on to the last uh, to the last panel. Um, so this is an interesting panel because this is a, an. A, a, a newly emerging area of great importance in the stem cell field, and we have some some great speakers uh, on this particular panel. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to do it for those not familiar with this. I'm going to give just a a quick two-minute overview of what we mean about modeling human disease and uh, kind of. Um, for the lay public, very often we just call it disease in a dish. And basically the concept is either that one takes normal cells, typically derived from stem cells, and stresses and perturbs them in, per in prescribed ways, or even more trendy now is to take disease cells. In other words, cells derived from a patient, typically turning them into iPS cells. And the, the advantage of doing that is now to use these cells to study mechanisms of the disease, to identify cellular signatures, diagnostic, prognostics, biomarkers, drug targets, and then maybe even discover some of the drugs against those targets, or at least leads to drugs, or at least something that can compensate for uh, the pathology. Now, even though it's getting a lot of attention, uh, those who, of us who have been in the stem cell field for a very long time recognize this is not new. Even in the early days, in the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, we are, would, would go to either fetuses, and I, I was trained as a neuroscientist, so we'd go to the nervous system of abortuses or miscarriages or fetuses or uh, autopsy specimens from diseased patients and look and make neural stem cells, for example, to see whether those could um, model whatever the disease was that the patient or the, or the fetus died of. With the advent of the ESL field, we had the opportunity to go to blastocysts that had been diagnosed as having a disease from pre-implantation genetic diagnosis turn them into ES cells, and then try from pluripotent cells to study that particular disease. And of course, the advent of IPS technology made it possible to get difficult to obtain cell types from living patients, which was a great advantage. Um, everybody is very familiar with making IPS cells, and, and I think we'll even hear about skipping the pluripotent stage and going directly from an accessible tissue to an inaccessible tissue directly called transdifferentiation. And of course, now one gets more than just nervous system. You can, if you know the right recipe, get whatever cell type is of interest to you or to the particular disease. Now, for those who do genomic profiling, I've been said, well, why would you ever, you know, if you just want to profile the genome, why do you have to go all the, all the way to making iPS cells? Well, I think most people in this audience recognize that when you make an iPS cell, in addition to genetic information, you get a functional cell biological dimension that you wouldn't get just by looking at the genome. You can get multiple lineages, sometimes clonally related, often in large num numbers and uniforms, so that you can really try to understand disease susceptibility or responsiveness. And then if you're interested in a gene defect, um, particularly if it's present in all cells, maybe you can understand why, for example, a, a disease that, that, that has the defect in every single cell is a neurologic disease, not a kidney disease, for example, Huntington's disease ways that I think you'll hear in the panel that people use the derivatives of IPSL are omics, trying to find out fingerprints, uh, subjecting these cells to stimulants or inducers or stressors or perturbagens to try to understand pathway analysis, turning them into biosensors so that you can screen compounds that then give you a response that you think is desirable and may be therapeutically useful to look at candidate gene testing, and, and now the advent of, of very efficient gene editing is starting to make that a very attractive use of iPS cells. And then, of course, correlating these with clinical outcomes, doing heavy-duty bioinformatic analysis, trying to get uh, panels of biomarkers, all of which ultimately may get us to personalized medicine. Notice that I'm not at all in any way, and this panel will not deal with the notion of using iPS cells as graft material. That, that's not what we're gonna be talking about here, though that obviously in some quarters is a use that these cells might be useful for. 
So we have three speakers that are, have really made great inroads in this entire uh, field of modeling human disease. The way I'd like to run this is each, one, each, each of the speakers will do uh, a 15 minute presentation and what I'm hoping we'll do is go through those, hold the questions and then that should give us a lot of time for a, a panel discussion because a lot of the questions that are going to be posed are going to go across speakers and we'll probably get to the essence of how well are we modeling human disease. So the first speaker is going to be Joe Wu from Stanford, followed by Juan Carlos from Salk, and then uh, Inder Verma from the Salk. So I want to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me here, especially uh, thanks to Evans for uh, giving this a wonderful introduction, and also thanks uh, to Mark McCullough, uh, who uh, is a great friend of mine, inviting me here to give her this talk. And um, so I'm going to talk, I'm a cardiologist by training, so most of my talk is going to be how we use uh, iPS cells uh, for cardiac disease modeling, for cardiac drug discovery at uh, the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute. Um, so this is my uh, disclosure uh, slide uh, um, right here. And let me just uh, switch to this. Um, so we have some partnerships with a couple companies. And also, um, we uh, recently started a small uh, startup company. And I think I'll only show one slide about the uh, startup company that we did because of this uh, particular emphasis of uh, the uh, forum. It's called Stem Cell Diagnostics. Uh, it's incorporated in 2011. Um, Exclusive licensing from Stanford in 2013, Series A in 2014. It's focused on disease modeling and drug discovery. Uh, myself, uh, Bobby Robbins, and Andrew Lee are the uh, co-founders, and we recently recruited uh, Chris Armstrong to be the uh, CEO of the company. Uh, and Stanford is also one of the major uh, investors for this company. So I'm going to uh, shift gear to what uh, the main focus of the uh, talk is. I think most of you would know that the cardiovascular disease remains the number one cause of morbidity and mortality in the U.S., uh, both for men and women. It's much higher than uh, cancer accidents uh, and other diseases uh, as well. And so I've been at Stanford uh, for about 10 years. I went there in 2004. And uh, at that time, uh, we were mainly interested in taking human ESL, differentiating the cardiomyocytes, and use it for transplantation purpose. Uh, that's the other arm that Evans uh, referred to about the cell therapy. And then when Shania discovered that you could take skin or blood and make iPS cells, uh, and it became a game changer for us because, as you know, we cannot make iPS cells from everybody in this room. And then if some of you have a disease, then we can understand the disease mechanism. And then likewise, uh, what we're really interested in doing is uh, doing this with drug discovery and drug uh, testing. And so um, <clears throat> I won't go over the exact details of how do we do cardiac differentiation. Uh, we've been working on it for basically 10 years, from 2004 to 2014. There are different protocols out there, and if you're interested in the cardiac differentiation protocol, you can, I will refer you to this review article uh, here. I just want to summarize what we've been able to do. So this is in uh, 2004, in which uh, you can see this is a cardiac differentiation run using human ear cells at that time. At that time, we're getting about 5% differentiation. The problem is here. Uh, here is what cardiologists call junk cells. Uh, we don't want these cells. Uh, we want these cells right here, but we don't want the, I mean, these could be brain cells, bone cells, or whatever cells that we're not interested in. And so this is in 2004. And in 2014, uh, it's very easy for us uh, to get blood uh, from uh, our patients and uh, isolate the PBMC, generate the iPS cells, and go do a differentiation in which we're getting about 90% plus uh, differentiation efficiency. And each batch run will get about 200 million cells. And from each batch run, uh, a lot of times we'll bank it and we'll also ship it to our collaborators uh, free of cost. And so you actually don't need a microscope. I mean, you can see this uh, beating uh, heart cells uh, right here uh, in this uh, six well uh, dish right here. And so this is, uh, I think, the process of making the cardiac differentiation has improved uh, dramatically over the past uh, 10 years. The other thing that's high priority for us is uh, because we want to expand the number of cardiomyocytes that we make. Uh, in the past, we've noticed uh, bats to bats variability depending on the uh, E8 or the MT sub bottles that we get uh, because of the FBS amount. So it took us about three years to come up with this uh, chemically defined generation of human cardiomyocytes. And in essence, uh, this allows us to make 
cardio mass, I said, in a more precise way, more defined uh, way, uh, without this a uh, lot of uh, variation. And uh, we boil it down to basically three compounds. It's a chemically defined media, basal media, uh, l ascorbic acid, and human recombinant uh, Albumin. I think the other advantage of this uh, pro uh, protocol is that in our lab, for example, when we generate this uh, media bottle, uh, it usually costs us about $50 per bottle. And so this is a dramatic uh, cost saving if you're thinking about industrial size uh, production of the uh, cardiomyocytes. So with this uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the uh, background, I want to quickly give you uh, what we're trying to do in terms of uh, disease modeling and also uh, in terms of uh, drug discovery that the evidence I mentioned about. So this is a cardiomyocyte, and within the cardiomyocyte, there are many, many different kind of diseases that could occur, uh, channelopathies uh, right here, uh, CPVT, ARVD, cardiomyopathy uh, here. And so I'm going to focus on two uh, diseases uh, here. These are the dilated and the hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. For the non-cardiologists out there, uh, this is a, uh, somebody with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, very, very thick septum, very thick uh, posterior wall. It's the most prevalent inherited cardiovascular disease. One in about 500 pe uh, people will get affected with this uh, uh, disease. It's actually one of the most common causes of sudden cardiac death. So if you have a young kid uh, who dropped dead or passed on the football field, basketball court, once the young kid is resuscitated, the, well, this is what the cardiologists are looking for. Uh, very thick muscles, uh, hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. Many genes have been identified, uh, and uh, back in 1989, uh, Christine Simons could identify myosin heavy chain 7 as the first thing involved uh, in this uh, process. So uh, we were uh, able to recruit a large family uh, in which the um, mother has a disease, and she, lucky for us, she had eight kids, and not so lucky for her, she had eight kids as well. And so kids one, two, three, and seven have the mutation. Kids one and two, I uh, have the phenotype. Phenotype is on the MRI. This is a saturated cut at the MRI. You can see a very thick uh, septum right here. We did whole genome uh, sequencing to show the mutation. It's at a myosin heavy chain 7 with the arginine uh, to histing switch. And so the question for us is uh, if we make iPSL differentiate the cardiomyocytes, do these kids, 1, 2, 3, and 4, the cardiomyocytes will look different from 4, 5, 6, and 8? And that's one main question. And uh, we did this about uh, three to four years ago, and what struck us was that the hypertrophic uh, kids, the iPSL cardiomyocytes have, have larger cell size, shown here compared to the normal kids. They're also more multinucleated, and you can aggravate the hypertrophy by giving them some kind of stress. This, you know, this is exactly what Evans was uh, talking about. Uh, in this case here, we give uh, isopaternal stress, and you can show the aggravation of the uh, hypertrophy. We also show that there's increased uh, nuclear uh, translocation of MFAT, uh, consistent with activation of the uh, calcium neuron pathway, and we can block this by cyclosporin and FK506. And so these are the cell size comparison and the multinucleation comparison. Clinically, uh, a lot of these patients actually have arrhythmia. Uh, so, you know, Sometimes they drop dead uh, playing uh, sports, and sometimes they drop dead just watching TV. And what's uh, striking to us was that these cardiomyocytes also have arrhythmia on, on uh, in vitro, and this is the calcium imaging uh, showing uh, the arrhythmias uh, right here. So we can come in with the calcium channel blocker, verapamil, to block the arrhythmia right here. And also the calcium channel blocker would also block the hypertrophy. So this is quite interesting for us in terms of developing an assay and then coming in to prove that the cells are have, uh, the drugs that have some kind of effect. So this has already been published. I won't go into the, all the ex uh, experimental details. I just want to highlight what we think is happening is that the mutation, myosin heavy chain 7 mutation, causes an increased uh, intracellular calcium. These are calcium handling defects, which leads to arrhythmia. There's also activation of the MFAT signaling pathway that I told you earlier, which leads to hypertrophy. We uh, screen for propanolol. We, knew, we know propanolol blocked these two pathways. We also screen for lidocaine, mixolytin, and manolazine, and we show that it blocks the arrhythmia. And we also screen for verapamil and cyclosporin A. So this is one example. Uh, the other example that I quickly highlight is uh, dilated uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is actually one of the most common cause of heart transplants uh, in young kids as well, and also for adults. Um, so in this particular family, this kid right here had a heart transplant already. Uh, his father also has cardiomyopathy, and his grandmother has a cardiomyopathy. So it runs in the family 
because it runs in the family, we call it familial dilated cardiomyopathy. The DNA sequencing, the troponin T mutation with the arginine tryptophan switch, just like the previous study, make the iPSL differentiate the cardiomyocytes. Took us about three years to fully characterize what's going on with the mutation, why the cells are not squeezing, and coming with drugs that to block it. Uh, in this case here, we did the beta blocker. Uh, as well as the circa 2A. Circa 2A is interestingly, it's already in clinical trial. Uh, it's called the Cupid trial using AB virus with circa 2A uh, to improve patients with the heart failure. So I gave you uh, two examples of how we model diseases uh, using um, genetic uh, uh, mutations, uh, hypertroph and dilated. You will see in the next five years or 10 years or so, more and more people will start going after acquired or multifactorial uh, diseases. In cardiology, for example, you know, what is the mechanism of radiation-induced cardiomyopathy? What is the mechanism of autoimmune? What is the mechanism of storage uh, cardiomyopathy and so forth? And I think the IPSL cardiomyopathy is a perfect model uh, platform uh, to study this. And just to give you an example of how we model acquired uh, cardiomyopathy, this is a recent study that we did uh, in which uh, we were going after viral cardiomyopathy. Viral cardiomyopathy is a very interesting disease. Uh, usually the patient come in, heart failure, we did an angiogram, and the angiogram shows no blockage, and the patient tells you that two to three months ago, uh, he or she had a uh, flu, and then the cardiology was kind of say, okay, you got a flu, that means you probably have viral cardiomyopathy. And so in this case here, we can uh, generate the uh, IPA cells, differentiate the cardiomyocytes, we then reintroduce it with Kasaki B virus, except it's tagged to luciferase. So the higher the transfection, the higher the luciferase signal. And so you can de determine the amount of transfection. And then once you develop this in vitro platform, uh, you can then come in with antiviral drugs to block it, right? So if you have a drug that uh, does not affect the color, that means the drug is probably not effective. If you have a drug that blocks the color production, that means the drug is antiviral drugs. And so uh, I won't go into the details of it. In this paper, we actually screen about five uh, different drugs uh, to, to show that some of the drugs work and some of the drugs that do not work uh, for viral cardiomyopathy. So what I want to do is a shift gear to the second phase of my talk, which is on uh, how do we do this uh, for uh, drug discovery. I think uh, for this audience here, everybody knows that the uh, pharmaceutical innovation is uh, endangered. Uh, it usually takes about $1.8 billion or $2 billion on average in 12 years uh, to uh, go from the beginning to the end uh, in terms of uh, drug development. Um, the, one of the major reasons for the inefficiency is because of the inaccuracy of the preclinical uh, drug discovery assays. Drugs work in mouse do not work in humans, and we see that time after time. Uh, another reason is that the cardiac toxicity is the number one cause of uh, uh, drug, drug withdrawal post-marketing. The concept here is very simple, right? So if I'm a drug company and I give you a drug and you have a rash, I probably don't care. I just say put some cream on it, right? steroid cream on it. On the other hand, if I'm a drug company, I give you a drug, and next morning you don't wake up. I care because I'm going to get sued, right? And so this is the reason the cardiac toxicity is the number one cause of a drug withdrawal post marketing accounting for about 35%. Now put yourself in terms of a drug company's perspective 10, 20 years ago. So you don't have access to patients' cardiomyocytes. You have access to mouse neonatal cardiomyocytes. I told you earlier, mouse and human are not, are not the same. Mouse cardiomyocytes are actually very finicky. You know, they only uh, stay alive in the dish for about four to five uh, days. And so what most uh, people do is that uh, they take a Chinese hamster ovary cell. Again, I emphasize the word ovary. Ovary cells do not beat, right? And uh, they take ovarian cells overexpress with her channel, and then they do all the drug screening on this, right? And so you're betting that your drug affects the Herc channel, and therefore it pops up. So if you have a drug that blocks the Herc channel, you basically kill the drug. If you have a drug that blocks the sodium channel, you won't get detected in this traditional assay, so this drug will go through the pipeline right here. And this is, uh, <clears throat> this is also uh, part of the reason why a lot of drugs have been withdrawn uh, for one reason or another related to poor arrhythmia, uh, heart attack, QT interval uh, prolongations. And so I'll give you the example of Cisapri. Cisapri was uh, withdrawn in 2000. When I was a health staff, I probably given out 500 prescriptions of Cisapri. We gave it to diabetic patients with gastroparesis. It works wonderfully well. For some reason, in 2000, when I was a health staff, we were notified that we can no longer give uh, Cisapri. 
And what's the reason? Well, Cisapri was marketed by, uh, it's called, it's, it was called Propulsive, marketed by Johnson & Johnson. And the FDA found that uh, uh, there were some issues with long QT and Tosad, and about uh, 400 cases, uh, 400 reported cases, about 80 deaths. Drug which won in the market uh, in 2000, $90 million awarded in terms of uh, class action lawsuits. And so we decided to go back to this drug because of my historical fascination with this uh, drug. Uh, we did a, what we call a, clinic, uh, a cardiac clinical trial in the dish. Took 12 patients, uh, three control, three long QT patients, three hypertrophic patients, three dilated cardiomyopathy patients. Make the iPS cells differentiate the cardiomyocytes. You will see at baseline the action potential of the long QT is already prolonged. So it makes sense, they have long QT. When you expose them to low dose uh, cisapride, nothing happens. Um, when you expose them to very high dose cisapride, all of them got arrhythmia. Now what happens if you expose them to physiologic dose uh, somewhere between 30 to 100 nanomolar? This is very interesting to us. So if you expose them to physiologic dose, normal patient right here, actually nothing happens. It's only patients who got long QT or hypertroph, they get into trouble. And dilated, actually nothing happens. So this begs a question, why is it out of 10 million people who took the medication, only 400 reported cases of uh, uh, the QT interval and uh, TOSAD, and only 80 dead? Is it true that if I give Cisapri to everybody in this room, all of us will be dropping dead? Probably not. It's probably patients who have pre-existing disease, they get into trouble. Normal patients, are they're fine. Except back in 2000, we were not routinely checking EKG. We were not routinely checking echocardiogram uh, when we give out this uh, medication. And so if you have this data right now uh, in the drug development phase, you probably do one or two things. One, you just kill the drug. Two, you ask a chemist to go back and reformulate it so that this disappears. Right here. And so this is, in my opinion, an example of having more information will help you in terms of the uh, drug development. Let me give you another quick example. Uh, this is uh, verapamil. Verapamil is an L-type calcium channel blocker approved by the FDA in 1982 uh, for treatment of high blood pressure angina pectoris and uh, cardiac arrhythmia. It's considered the workhorse of, uh, of uh, cardiac medication because it's so cheap and we give it to a lot of uh, people. And so if you put the verapamil on CHO cells, the Chinese hamster ovarian cell that overexpress the Herc channel, verapamil is actually low IC50. It's toxic. It's not safe because it blocks the Herc channel. What happens if you put verapamil on my iPSL cardiomyocyte? The IPC50 is actually quite high. It tells you it's a safe drug. The reason is the verapamil blocked the Herc, which prolongs the QT. You also block the uh, calcium channel, uh, which shortens the QT. So at the end of the day, you balance out each other. And so this is an example of a false positive drug uh, uh, testing in which it's cardiotoxic using CHO cells, but it's actually safe uh, using patient iPSL cardiomyocyte. So the question is, why is this drug in the market then? Well, keep in mind this drug was approved in 1982. So uh, the CHO cells with the Herc channel, they, you know, people started testing around 1993, 1994. So this, th this is the reason why it's in the market. If he had come out with this drug today, it would have been killed uh, during the R&D phase because it affected the uh, Herc channel right here. Uh, the other thing what we're trying to do, as Evan says, is uh, the genome editing. Uh, this is a uh, pretty big portfolio in our lab. Uh, we have several people working on it. And so uh, the main reason is that it bypasses uh, patient recruitment. So in the past, I had to go after the dilated cardiomyopathy with Zaponin T. I had to go after the hypertrophy uh, with the uh, myosin heavy chain 7 mutation. Now I can just uh, do genome editing and create mutations. And let me just give you an example. This is a normal patient and edited, and this is by pass clamping to show the action potential uh, pattern here. This is a patient, a patient who has the uh, uh, long QT1 mutation. You can already see a prolonged action potential. We now take this patient, your normal control, do genome editing to express the same mutation. You can see the prolonged action potential. And so this only took us about uh, two to three months to get this whole process set up. And so I think, in my opinion, this is going to also be a game changer in terms of using genome editor lines to do your drug discovery uh, phase uh, right here. So uh, in our lab, uh, we actually have uh, my iPSLs, and uh, the postdocs are doing genome editing of my iPSLs to create 96 uh, different mutations. And so you probably cannot see this uh, right here. These are different kind of myosin, laminin, 
uh, ACTC uh, mutations and so forth right here. So this is from 1 to 48. And uh, another one, another whole list uh, right here. So think about how long it would take me to recruit these patients. I may never see them in the clinic because, you know, unless we do DNA sequencing on them, we don't know what the mutation is. Now it's only going to take me about two years to create 96 different lines that has all these mutations. And so once we make them, we'll also make them available to the uh, public as well. Um, and so uh, the last thing is uh, we're also going after different ethnicity uh, difference. Uh, this is a recent study that I would just briefly highlight uh, showing that, uh, you know, IPA cells uh, actually have some uh, major differences uh, depending on what the ethnicity you are. So this is the ALDH uh, genetic uh, polymorphism. It explains for how, why some Asians, including myself, when I drink alcohol, my face flush, and that's because uh, I don't have this uh, enzyme. Uh, it's actually a protective gene against alcoholism because you can't drink too much. Uh, it's also a good gene because uh, it's a lazy man's exercise, right? so you don't have to exercise. You just drink it, your heart rate shoots out to 150s, and you flush. <laughs> and um, and so, so we did, uh, we, we recruited 10 Stanford undergrads who are Asian Americans. Five of them had the mutation, five of them do not. Make iPA cell, differentiate the heart cells, expose them to some kind of, uh, to different kind of stress, and clearly show that the uh, the Asian, uh, the, the undergrads with the, the uh, ALDH mutation, their cardiomyocytes is much, much more susceptible to uh, different kind of stress. Also explains for clinical studies and epidemiology studies showing that Asians who have this particular mutation are more susceptible to uh, coronary artery disease. So um, this is what we're trying to do at the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute. Uh, we're trying to make a bank of about 1,000 lines for drug discovery. And uh, this will consist of different ethnicity, different sex, different age, using Taylor and CRISPR. Uh, we routinely do uh, DNA and RNA-seq on them. We also link it to the Farm GK database with the Russ Salmons group. Uh, and then we, uh, for all the patients, we have a very, very clear uh, database-driven uh, uh, bioinformatics uh, platform. And we're working with the NHLBI on the IPSL biobanking, and also working with the FDA on drug safety testing. And we're going to set this up as a shared resource. So as of today, if you have an interesting cardiac patient, you can send us the blood. We will make it. We will bank it at Stanford. We will give you back the IPSL cardiomyocyte for free. Okay, and so this is a uh, interesting. Uh, 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 this is a very important setup for us. So I just want to uh, conclude uh, by um, uh, acknowledging the postdocs, uh, my co uh, collaborators at Stanford, and also uh, my collaborators uh, outside of Stanford. And I think, if I may, I just want to sh uh, just uh, sh spend one minute showing you three cases. So I'm a, a cardiologist, a clinician, as I explained uh, in the beginning. We always uh, like to end or start a presentation by case or scenario. So this is a case scenario number one. Uh, you're the big pharma. This is 2020. Uh, you're the CEO of a company. The high cost of R&D is killing into your margins. Uh, this is bad. Uh, clinical trials are costly and show mostly negative data. And you're interested in adopting new assays that will allow you to study, uh, in my case, uh, cardiac uh, channels, metabolism, contractility, and also to screen for toxicity. So, you know, here we're trying to uh, develop these uh, iPA cells uh, to exactly for this uh, platform. Now, this is uh, 2025, uh, 10 years later. You and your spouse has five kids. Two of them already had heart transplant at age 15 and 12. The other three are age 10, 7, and 5 are fine. Now, the DNA sequencing, if it's done at Stanford, we couldn't find any mutation. And you ask your doctor, me, uh, what's going to happen to your other three kids? We said, we don't know. We're just going to do echo and MRI on your three other kids, right? Not very satisfactory to your patients. Now, if I were to propose to you that the patient 15 and patient 12, the age 15 and age 12, the iPSL cardiomyocyte does not squeeze. The age 10 and age 7, they squeeze like this. And age 5, they do not squeeze. Even though I do not know what the mutation is, am I confident enough to tell the family that H5 will develop the disease later on and we're going to uh, do a much more aggressive surveillance and also start the medication earlier? So this gets into the concept of personalized diagnostics uh, for the iPS cells. And lastly, this is what I really care about. Uh, uh, this is uh, 20 years from now. You're the doctor. 
and uh, your patient with heart attack or heart failure needs to be on medicines, what medicine should you give them? Instead of having your patient as a guinea pig, can you test the drugs first on their many me surrogates using the different uh, platforms I hear? And I think this will be quite interesting for our discussion. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.